Would you please open up your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 16, at the last verse, 27. And we will also go in the next uh, book, which is first, first Corinthians as well, chapter 1 and 18 to uh, 30, Lord willing. So Romans 16, 27 is where we'll start. And the title for today's sermon would be The Only Wise God. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord, you alone deserve all glory, all praise. You alone, O oh Lord, is the only wise God. It is my prayer, O oh Lord, that we as your people here, gathered together in your name, we would really come to the conviction, to the uttermost belief, O oh Lord, fully convinced in our own hearts and in our own minds that you are the wise God and no one else, nothing else. I pray that you would bless your people through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, this phrase is from Paul who wrote this in the book of Romans, in the closing of the book of Romans. And it has rightly been said, and I agree with it completely, that when no, a lot of our brothers and sisters would say that the greatest letter ever written was the letter of Romans. And the reason why for me personally as well and as well as resonated throughout the years is that the reason why Romans is such a wonderful letter is because it expounds so much on the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That we are really, Lord, uh, saved by grace through faith. That this is the kind of God that we have. His love, His grace, His holiness, and really His ways. That He would really be, be able to choose a people for Himself. He would be able to save them, though we are truly unworthy. So it takes Paul 16 chapters to write this letter. Romans, no? We later on divided it into 16 chapters. It's a long letter. And at the end of this wonderful letter about how God is so good, how God is so gracious, he says, to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. It takes someone who has utter trust, who is utterly convinced that God, the living God that we have, the God of the Bible, is the only one who is wise to be able to say this and give all the glory to Him forevermore. But Paul should never be the special case, no? Paul is not like he is a cut above all the rest of the Christians that only Paul would feel this way. Everyone should feel this way. And so it is my prayer, my aim, that I will be able to preach to you God's word today. That you yourself will see God as the only wise God to praise Him and to give Him glory today and forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. We need wisdom, don't we all? Wisdom is so important that anytime we gather in small groups or we have the opportunity to pray for one another, what do we do? One of us at the least will say, please pray that God will give me wisdom. Please pray that I will have the wisdom and whatever it is in life that you're asking for help for, you ask the Lord for help by letting Him or asking Him to give you wisdom in that particular Thing that's going on in your life. Indeed, we need wisdom to deal with our, all of our relationships. We need wisdom on how we could love our spouse, how to treat them well, how to nurture them. We need wisdom in how we could raise godly children. We need wisdom when our children are older and they become adults. We need wisdom when we are in our jobs, in 
whatever it is that God has placed us in, whether it be a full-time missionary, a full-time pastor, or a full-time business person, or a, uh, in a professional, or whatever stage we are in, whether we be students still, we need wisdom in all areas of our life. Indeed, without it, we would be doing things so foolish that we would invite troubles upon troubles in our life and it would spell disaster. Second thing we see here is that God's wisdom, as it has been said in the Old Testament, is in Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. God declared that His thoughts are not like our thoughts. His ways are not like another human being's ways. All of our ways. God is simply different. He thinks different. He does things differently. And this is what he declares. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. And there is no measure, right? It's not a finite thing to measure the heavens and the earth. It's infinity. You can't measure it. There's no limit to the distance of the heavens and the earth. So what God has been saying through His prophet Isaiah and to us is that there is His ways, His thinking, His wisdom is infinitely better than all of us. If we gather all our wisdom, all our collective wisdom and and we can say here in GCAF right now, it's, a, it's substantial, right? A lot of us have been alive here 50, 60, 70 years, and we've been through a lot. We've gained so much experience and wisdom. A lot of us here are really good at what they do in life. But if we gather all our wisdom here, God's wisdom is simply higher, infinitely higher. His ways, infinitely better. If we gather all of humankind's wisdom, all of humankind's innovations, philosophers, scientists, from Adam all the way to tomorrow, God's wisdom and His ways is still simply better. In Job, God says, He alone is the one who understands the way to wisdom. He alone knows where it can be found. And if you read the beginning of chapter 28 of Job, you will see that it doesn't start with God. It starts with men. And how men are likened to miners. And miners, what, they do, what do they do? They dig, right? They, they look for precious metals they dig for precious stones and when they discover them they they have a way to make it become even brighter right they make it they polish it they take they take the lump of stones and they they separate the rocks and the, the unvaluable materials to what is precious in other words men can find precious metals at the deepest corners of the earth they have innovations that they can make these things possible man can advance man has a way to think and, and improve upon life to discover what is precious but then here's the contrast before it reaches this, this verse 23 where and who can find wisdom and the answer to that was nobody no one on earth though we are so good at finding precious metals Discovering jewels worth millions and billions of dollars or pesos. Nobody can find this precious thing called wisdom. Only God understands the way to wisdom. Only He knows where it can be found. So we know that wisdom... And in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is a major theme 
Everybody should seek wisdom. This, should, this is something we should want above wealth, above material things. Wisdom. Seek wisdom. Okay? So we know wisdom is important. We know and we ask for wisdom even in our prayers. And my aim is to show you that it can only be found in God. That God's wisdom is better. So I ask you the question for all of us. For you personally, as you, as you sit and listen there to the Word of God, why is it hard for you? Yes, even here, us, the church. Why is it hard that many times in our life, we have a hard time trusting in God's wisdom for us, for our lives, for our families, for our, our businesses? For our, our means of livelihood. Why is it hard? And for that, I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we'll look at verse 18. And Lord willing, we can finish um, until 30. So it says there, For the message of the cross... Is foolishness to those who are dying, perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. In verse 27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, Boast in the Lord. You know why we have a hard time, even for us, redeemed people of God, many times, sometimes, for some of us, we have difficulty in trusting in God's wisdom. God said in His Word, and here in 1 Corinthians, there's two kinds of wisdom. God's wisdom, man's wisdom. And they are not compatible with each other. Let me propose to you that you would agree right now as you are in your head that yes, God's wisdom is better. I'm sure you have no problem agreeing with the truth here in the Bible as I preach to you. But I tell you where you are having difficulty is trusting the truth that you are agreeing to be true for your life and the reason is because you have a wisdom in you a human wisdom and in it it goes against the wisdom of god i gave you four it's not a, it's not comprehensive but maybe this could start us to to really examine where have we been trusting in in terms of wisdom 
When we ask the Lord for wisdom, we're praying or asking Him for help to give us wisdom. Are we really asking for God's wisdom or are we asking, you know, a green light for us to do our wisdom? And so, first possible reason, common reason why we might have a hard time in, in trusting in God's wisdom is this. Men, in the wisdom of men, sees that God's wisdom is foolishness. Foolishness. What's foolishness? It's not wise. It's not good. It's not something that I can trust in. It's something that will bring me to ruin. It will invite trouble in my life. In first verse 18 tells us, tells us that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are dying, to those who don't believe, those who don't trust Christ. And why can't they trust Christ? Because they think that the message, the good news of Jesus Christ is utter rubbish. It's foolishness. It doesn't bring any good. I don't see anything that could contribute to my life. I have an example. Last week, we went on a trip to Davao so that I could, for me, I could speak to our president of our denomination and together with the family of our, one of our elders, Ron Ron. And so we were two vehicles. We were uh, in a convoy. And we went there. I went there on Monday. Ron Ron and his family arrived on Tuesday. We spoke to the president on Wednesday. And then we went home on Thursday. On our way back from Davao to Cagayan de Oro, by the grace of God, I stand before you right now alive simply by his grace. Because uh, what happened was that, you know, when we're traveling long distance, you travel at a faster pace right so over 100 kilometers i average 100 i try to keep it 100 so um we are almost near cagayan de oro this is like 500 meters away from manolo cent uh, fortich central and what happens is that all of a sudden we hear the back of our tire go and then i pulled that i pulled to the side of the road and i saw that my tires were you know Severely damaged already. And I, I could just imagine if that happened in the front, my front tire instead of my back. Uh, so by the grace of God, I stand before you. He, he wants you to hear this message. <laughs> and, you know, I had my wife with me. I had, I had our, we had our two kids with us. And later on when we gave the praise report and thanking God for His grace to our family, my brother-in-law pointed out that, hey Dave, you know what? If you travel long distance, there is a standard, you know, a standard of safety. This is not something that's already, you know, uh, nobody has ever wrote down a, a manual for. There is a standard, a manual for safety that if you travel long distance, you should check your tires. You know, if your tires are more than five years old, then they should be replaced, especially if you travel long distance. And, my brother-in-law pointed out to me, you know, if you see cracks in your tires, you should have it changed. Now, there's a manual. It's, it's widely known. I know that, okay? Why didn't I do it? Why didn't I follow the manual? Because of practical wisdom. You know, if I, if I follow that, I will spend a lot of money. Practicality, or me being so practical, I want to save money as much as I can. So I said to myself, okay, I know five years are, are more, it's more than five years, but this tires has brought us so far. You know, we've been to Sambuanga, we've been to Jensen already, we've been to Davao, not just this one time, we've been to Davao several times. You know, I look at the tires, it was still had good threads in it, and I said to myself, no need, right? I want to save money. You know why we think, uh, you know why I thought the, the, the manual was, was foolish, not practical? Because it was going to make me spend money that I didn't want to spend, right? I, I wanted to save money. So what, lo and behold, what happened? I didn't follow the standards, procedure, or the, the, the state. I put my, what, my family at unnecessary risk, okay? And we, had, we blew our tire because... Though it was supposed to be replaced already, I did not because of practical wisdom. It works. Eh? 
it has worked for many years already. And the idea there was that why not one more trip? I'll, I'll change it when it really is, you know, there's no more thread, right? It's just a smooth looking tire. I'll, I'll change it then. And it cost me. How many of us sees God's word that way? How many of us see and hear the word of God preached? How many of you read the scriptures for yourself and see and agree to the truth of God? And then you look at your life and then you, you, you count, well, you know what? If I'm going to follow Christ, it's going to cost me. It's not practical. Maybe later, right? But I can rationalize with practical human wisdom. I can have good reasons, human wisdom reasons to tell the, the, the truth of God, the wisdom of God in His scriptures as He has revealed. Later na lang, Lord. Not yet, Lord. Uh, no lang, Lord, because you know it's not practical. So we have another term today when we think God's word is foolish. We say it's not practical. We say, yeah, that's ideal, but it's not practical. It doesn't apply to our reality. It doesn't make sense. If I do that, you know what, Lord? If I follow your word, if I follow what you say in your word on how we should be in the church, on how we should deal with sin, on how we should, how we should turn away from useless idols, on how we should rely on you and your wisdom and your ways rather than our ways, you know what, Lord? It will cost me so much. It will mean losses, financial losses. It would mean I would be put to shame. You know what? It's so embarrassing if people knew my, the, the, my, my problems. I might not have the respect anymore as a leader. And so there are so many good practical reasons that make us think that God's word doesn't apply to that particular case in your life. And if you're thinking that way, oh, I am sure it's not just one area of your life. It's more, more, and more. And pretty soon, you will be thinking, you will just obey God's wisdom or trust God's wisdom when it is convenient, when it is safe, when it is easy to do so. But when it becomes hard, costly, when it becomes difficult, painful, risky, when it, when it would invite trouble in your life, you would say, that's foolishness, O oh Lord. You mean to say, if I obey you, other people will hate me, not like me, will talk against me. It will cost that. It's not practical, Lord. So that's reason number one. A lot of us would agree with the truth, but we would have difficulty in trusting the wisdom and the truth of God because here's our human wisdom. Here's our practicality. It doesn't work. It makes us, huh? How could that work? It goes against what I really see and how what makes life good go in this world. Second reason would be all of us have grown up in this world. All of us therefore have been influenced by human wisdom. We can't escape from it. This is how we used to operate. This is how we think by default. We do by default operate in human wisdom. That's why if now that we are in the church, that we have heard and tasted that God is good, sometimes we go back to our default ways because this is what we were used to. We saw result. And when we try God's way and then we see, ah, oh, it's not working, we go back. So all of us have been influenced. We know this. And you see that when God says in verse 19, 24, it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. You know when a lot of us decide that God's wisdom and God's ways is not working? When your plans is not working. 
when it seems to be that the best plans you have for your life is getting frustrated. It's not coming true. What do you do then? A lot of us then will say, okay, I tried it God's way. Now maybe I need to try it my way because I tried it God's way and it didn't work. Okay? What I, I, what I wanted for life, what I asked for wasn't coming true. The trajectory of my life isn't the way I wanted to go. Now I'm going to go my way. That's what some of us do. When we're not utterly convinced that God's wisdom, God's ways is better. We would start to buy in to the temptation that maybe, maybe my way is better. But God has already declared that He will destroy the wisdom of the wise in this world. He will frustrate the intelligence of this world. In verse 20, where is the wise man? And the answer is nowhere. Where is the scholar? Dead. Nothing. Where is the philosopher of this age? And the answer to that is gone. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? If you think about it, the Christians who lived in Corinth, who this letter was for, were people living in a very rich city, a Roman city. They had cultural leaders. They had philosophers. Their, they had their education system that was a cut above other civilizations. They had business gurus. They had relationship advisors. And their system was all built in the corrupt system of the world. And the people around them, all the successful people, businessmen, uh, uh, celebrities, all had their minds and their lifestyle that God and His truth was foolish. And that was the major influence that they were in. But you know what? When God said, where is the philosopher of this age? Though brilliant, as brilliant as man can be, they have no hope. They are, they have, there is no comparison to the wisdom of God. Who are, who are our famous philosophers? I'll give you an example. Freud, one of the most influential philosophers. You know what he did in his side in his time? That basically human beings are bad, but it's okay to be bad. I'm quoting someone on this. You know, Carl Rogers would say, man is basically good, but it's really okay to be good. So let your goodness hang out. And Skinner would say, man is not good, man is not bad. We're just reacting to what's going around us. We're just like an animal, depending on a stimuli. And that's our philosophers. They can't even agree. Right? There's a jumble of confusion. Why? Because as brilliant as they are, only God knows wisdom. Only wisdom. Wisdom can only be found in Him. True wisdom, that is. Not human wisdom. So these are human wisdom. Number three, human wisdom is so appealing because it agrees with us, right? It can give us what we also want. We can get what we want in this life, in this earth, on this earth, if we operate simply by human wisdom alone. Wisdom can make us rich, human wisdom. Human wisdom can get us the respect of other people. And if that is what you want, if that's all that you strive for, if you think that being rich and being influential, being respected by your fellow man is all that there is life to it, that's what you would go for. But as children of God, aren't we told that God and in His presence is better? Didn't we hear a psalmist cry that a day in your court is better than a thousand days without to be in your presence? Didn't we hear the psalmist cry that 
Who, who, am I, who do I have except you? There is no one else besides you. The child of God knows that God is his life, his love, his greatest treasure. There is simply nothing else better. And so think about it in verse 26. Brothers, think, think, remember. Remember back when you, before God called you. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential by human standards. Not many of you were noble or rich, born rich in, by human standards. And yet, you see, God in His wisdom saved you, called you, chose you. Why would you go back and trust in human wisdom when human wisdom didn't even want you? With human wisdom thought lowly of you. See, that's borderline or even beyond foolishness to think. And why would you want human wisdom bef- rather than God and who He is? God is simply better than human wisdom. Even if human wisdom can give you earthly riches and prestige. What is that? compared to heavenly treasures and being honored by the king of kings. Last is this, no one can know God by human wisdom. That's the reason why any unbelievers cannot know God based on his human reasoning, his intellect, His wisdom alone. Here, as God's people, we know that we cannot go to the Lord except when He calls us and draws us near. We would never understand God without His divine, gracious help to make us believe. In 1 Corinthians 1.21, this is simply already a, a closed case since God in His wisdom saw to it that the world would never know Him through human wisdom, would never come to trust Him, would never come to believe in Him, would never come to see Him as precious, basing on reasoning and human wisdom alone. It is God's wisdom to use the foolish preaching of men to save, uh, with the foolish preaching of His Word, to save those who will now believe in Him. You think about it. A lot of us have a hard time in believing God because we're asking for proof. Give us proof. Isn't it? Just like the Jews. We believe you, Jesus, if you just give us enough miracles and then we'll believe you. And the Greeks, we believe you in Jesus if you fit according to our reasoning, our wisdom, then we'll believe you. Filipinos, we, are, we can also say the same thing, right? To see is to believe. Oh, convince me nga if the Bible is true. Convince me nga if it's really God's word. And a lot, of, a lot of people try to find God, try to convince themselves to trust God basing on human reasoning alone and wisdom, not faith. But we know that it was by grace, the grace of God. And He gave it through faith in the Son, Jesus Christ, to save us. And it is those who are being saved that will see God not as foolish, but as wise. So maybe if this is something that you're really having a hard time, I still can't believe God and His wisdom. I think it's still foolishness. You know what the Bible and the Word of God is saying? Those who think that, believe that, and never change the trajectory of their life are those who who are perishing. And we already know as we went through the book of Matthew that we could be here in GCAF, attend Sunday services faithfully and yet find to our utter horror in Matthew 7 that we say, Lord, Lord, let me in. And he will say, I don't know you. Don't have a relationship with me. Where have you been trusting and relying on in the wisdom of how you operate life? Have you been living in the wisdom of man? Have you been 
crying and depending and drawing and, de- and praying to live according to the wisdom of God. It is not an easy thing if you are a human being because we see in this world those who live by the wisdom of God will be seen as weak, foolish, and will be mistreated. But I go back to our main point. Why, despite the difficulty, despite those challenges and the reality that there is the wisdom of man, it can bring us wealth and and prestige. It can make us uh, be accepted by our community. This is how we've been operating by default. Why do we and why should we arrive at the conviction that the wisdom of God is better? that we could leave behind our human wisdom and trust in the wisdom of God. Well, verse 25 tells us that the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. We know that as we read as well earlier, that it is the wisdom of God that He reveals to us in Jesus Christ and on the cross. That's, that's the, the message of 1 Corinthians, right? The, the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God the Son, coming down from heaven to earth, living the sinless life, would lay down His life willingly for the sake of the many that He has come to save. And he lays down his life and dies on the cross. And this is what is seen as foolishness. This is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God displayed on Christ Jesus on the cross is seen as foolishness, is seen as weakness, is seen and despised. And many of them believed as they passed by Jesus Christ hanging on the cross thinking, well, this man is a, must have done something wrong, right? And they believe in the lies that was the slander against Jesus Christ on that day until today. Why? Because the wisdom of God that was displayed on Christ Jesus on the cross is seen as foolishness. But why should you believe? You who believe now, why should you believe in the wisdom of God that the rest of the world thinks is foolishness, weakness? Because this is what and how you are saved. This is how you came to know God's love. This is how you were forgiven in His eyes. This is what made it possible that you could be part now of His family. This is the reason why you could enter into the throne of grace with thanksgiving in your heart, coming to Him boldly, Because He has called you in and drawn you and justified you and cleansed you. God's wisdom is displayed on Christ Jesus and in your life, believer. If you think that human wisdom is better, I urge you to look at Christ Jesus on the cross. And to remember who you were before He saved you. And you believed in Him. And He cleansed you. In chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, verse 6 and 7, it says this. We do use wisdom when speaking to people who are mature in their faith. So we're not talking here foolishness. I'm not saying things foolishness. I'm speaking to you and only the wisdom of God, the truth of God. I I will preach to you the scripture and I will preach nothing else but scripture. Why? Because this is the wisdom of God. This is the way we live. And to those who are mature in the faith, this is received by faith as wisdom. It goes on, but it isn't the wisdom of this world or its rulers who will soon disappear. 
So yes, we will do, we do teach wisdom, the wisdom of God. We will preach the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of men. In verse 7, we speak of God's hidden and mysterious wisdom that God decided to use for our glory long before the world began. God's wisdom is as high as the heaven is from the earth. God's wisdom is what will save us if we trust in Him and His wisdom displayed in Christ Jesus and the cross. God's wisdom is simply better because it comes from the all-knowing God, the one who is the source of wisdom. I urge us all here in GCAF, trust God. Don't just agree with your head that His truth are good or better or, or, or ideal, but then somehow cut it off away from your life by thinking that His ways, if you live it out, is not practical. No, it is practical. The wisdom of God is to be lived out. It's to be lived. This is how we live. If you think you can save your life by preserving it, you lose it. But if you lose your life for Christ, you gain life. Paul knows. God knows that this goes against what we have believed all our lives. What we have been taught in our schools. To rely on philosophy, to rely on psychology, apart from God. But they don't mix. They don't mix. It's either you trust God through and through, or you're trusting in your human wisdom also. I'll close with this story. And why it's so good and we're so blessed and joy and, and happy are we if we cling to God's word, we trust his wisdom through and through. There's a story here of Miriam and her husband who had just finished their evening prayers and was going to sleep na for the night. Suddenly, when members of the terrorist group called al Shabaab broke into their home in Kenya, these extremists beheaded Miriam's husband, then tried to force Miriam and her daughter to convert to Islam. But they refused, standing firm in their faith in Christ. Miriam and the rest of the family managed to escape, but the terrorists, those extremists, stole everything they had, their livestock, and destroyed their home. But even, even, in the, in the midst of that awful attack, Miriam was strengthened and comforted because she held on to what God has said in Isaiah 54, 17, that no weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed. I don't know where you are right now in your life. I don't know the troubles that you are facing. But I know this is an everyday struggle. Whether we will trust God for our today and His wisdom in His ways or do I try to find another way and somehow seek it through human wisdom. So let me shine for you the light that is the word. God has spoken that His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. If you have been frustrated because nothing is working in your life, then maybe that is the wisdom of God working in your life right now. Where will you turn? Where are you turning? Are you going and drawing near to God, relying more in Him? Or are you learning to stand on your own, to think that you have a form of self-righteousness, a form of self-independence that you can make it on your own because you have just been going through life fine without Him. But God said, one day, the wisdom of the wise in this world 
will come crumbling down. The intelligence of the intelligent will be all frustrated. Maybe this is like what we challenged you last week. Choose you this day on which side you will stand. Whether it be in the human wisdom or in God and trusting in Him fully in His ways and in His wisdom. May you all come to believe with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might that God is simply better. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I pray that my brothers and sisters here will see for how wonderful you are. This is how we come to believe in you. This is how we got saved through your wisdom, not our ways. No human beings could think of how the solution to the dilemma we were in, that we faced a holy, righteous God whose wrath was on sinners, whose penalty was death, that all, no human, other human beings could pay for this price that we had to pay for your justice to be sated. And yet, you send down your son to die for the place of sinners. The world whom, those whom the world considered to be nothing, lowly, none of us were deserving yet you saw us to be so in your wisdom this is how you saved us in your way may we all lord not just rely on you to be saved from hell but rely on you for all things even the way we love our spouses the way we operate in this world and earn our living and the way we raise children and how we could honor our parents this way your way oh lord and not our ways help us and bless us to rely in you and surrender to you fully in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.